Hi, I'm Dan Robinson with the Great Lakes Spirituality Project, and I'm very happy today to be talking with Katie Wolf. Katie is the Executive Director of the Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council located in Petoskey, Michigan. And welcome, Katie. Glad you're here. Glad to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here. Katie began her environmental career with the Kentucky Department of Environmental Protection's Division of Water, where she developed an internationally recognized citizen monitoring program called Water Watch. After moving to Michigan to coordinate the World Conference on Large Lakes on Mackinac Island, she directed the Michigan Governor's Environmental Youth Awards and served as public participation consultant for the Great Lakes Water and Resources Planning Commission. Later, she directed external, external relations for the Consortium for International Earth Science Information Network and directed the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. She just completed her work at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary as Education Community and Outreach Coordinator and Liaison to Friends of the Thunder Bay Sanctuary. And then she just, as I said, recently started her position as Executive Director of the Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. Wow, congratulations on the new position, Katie. Yeah, I've come full circle because, you know, if you're familiar with the Watershed Council, we do a lot of lake and stream monitoring and citizen science. So I, I started out in that arena and now, you know, I'm back in that arena and I'm thrilled because I've always really liked to be, um, to have a good balance of being out, you know, in the field and then, you know, being able at this opportunity, um, I have the opportunity to mentor younger people and I really enjoy that. Well, that's great. I see a lot of the tip of the mitt, uh, the Watershed Council's uh, posts online, and you're doing some great work with the folks in that area. It's exciting to see. It's very diverse. We do a lot of different things. And so, you know, I've been on a steep learning curve for the past month and a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's back up a second and let's kind of take a look at the whole picture, because that's a lot. I mean, you've done a lot of things over the course of your career, and that environmental thread has kind of run through that. So why why has that been the focus of your work? Well, I've, um, for a couple things, one, as a child, I spent a lot of time with my father in the woods, and uh, that was my happy space, and I, I think just, uh, I think I was a little precocious, and so my mother would send me out to spend more time with him, and he was great about explaining everything, you know, about nature, and I just really developed a strong love for it. Yeah. So what was the what was the draw? Now, you're we were talking before you said you were from Louisville, Kentucky, originally, and you obviously, as I mentioned, worked in Kentucky for a few years. What was the draw to come north to the Great Lakes Basin? Well, I actually worked with a person in Kentucky and we did fantastic work together. And then he his ambition was always to work on the Great Lakes and all his education was around doing Great Lakes research and policy development. And when he moved to Michigan, I realized I had a missing piece. Yeah. And um, so I actually came to Michigan, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. One was love, <laughs> um, but the second was when I was working in Kentucky, Michigan was such a leader in the environmental area, as well as in the environmental education area. So it was an opportunity for me to come to a state that had phenomenal programs and to get that experience. Yeah. So do you, do you think, um, so what year did you move for, did you move north for the, for the large lake? Believe it or not, I've been here uh, for more than half my life now. Um, I moved to Michigan in 1986. Okay. So that, so, that dates me a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the interim, 36 years or so, do you think Michigan is still that leader in environmental? Um, I think in certain ways, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have the reputation that we did have, um, you know, and particularly it's, it's more what's happening, I think, at the local level. I think there's some incredible things happening locally and regionally. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I think there's been so many cutbacks over the years to different programs and reconfiguring things. And so I think we're, we're kind of getting our game back on a little bit, but, you know, on top of that, the, I think climate change has complicated how we handle environmental issues and we've become so global in our scope that the challenges are also different. So I, 
you know, I don't know if it's that we've slipped so much back as the challenges have gotten a lot bigger and our capacity has not grown with that. So um, you've, you've worked on both sides, I mean, geographically speaking, both sides of Michigan, on the Lake Huron side, now on the Lake Michigan side. And you mentioned um, climate change kind of complicating the work. In what ways? I mean, what ways are you seeing climate change impacting the work that you do and the work that the organizations do that you've been a part of? Well, you know, when I first came up here, um, invasive species were not as uh, big of a challenge. And now we're seeing, you know, uh, with the changes in climate on almost, you know, an annual basis, we're seeing the temperatures, you know, rising or, you know, having more extreme weather. And so you're seeing a difference in the flora and fauna because of that. And so, you know, and on top of that, we have, again, more of a global world. And so we have issues with invasive species we haven't had before. And I think also just the demands we place on water. Uh, you know, I have a, a dear friend who says as much as people talk about how much they love the Great Lakes, in reality, we don't always treat them so well. Uh, we don't always think about those people who live downstream from us. And in some cases, you know, we're more focused on what's immediately around us in today, as opposed to looking toward future generations and the impact our actions have on the broader world. Yeah, it reminds me of that quote, and I'm sure you know Wendell Berry, being from Kentucky, that do unto yeah. others as you would have people upstream do unto you. Yes, kind of. absolutely. <laughs> Wendell Berry is one of my big heroes. I, yeah, I love him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, you're kind of like me. I actually lived in Kentucky for six years at two different places. I'm originally from Indiana, but, but the short version is I'm not from the Great Lakes Basin originally. So you're kind of like me, a transplant. And you've been up here now for 36 years. So I presume you have, you've had other opportunities to go other places and you've chosen not to. And what, what keeps you here? What, what, what's your spiritual connection? If you, or do you have one to the lakes? What's that like? I definitely do. The, um, the lakes I feel like they pull me in. Uh, you know, people ask me, how do you live up there with all the, you know, the winters and things like that? And I've surprised myself how much I have totally embraced the elements. I find every day and sometimes every hour on the Great Lakes is a whole new experience. It's just a constant change. And, you know, you see all the sunrises and sunset photos. And yet when you're in that moment, it, it is very much to me a spiritual experience. I, you know, I find myself just in my head naturally saying, thank God, or, you know, I mean, there's, there's that, uh, the beauty in Michigan is just uh, something bigger than you can really even describe. And I think the lakes are part of that. I will also say, I feel that way about the forest. You know, where I live, it's a little peninsula and there's a beautiful hike along the shore, but in the woods. And I can just feel, um, you know, I would say my spirituality, uh, my thankfulness for nature and that I have the ability to take those walks in such a beautiful place. And, you know, I just I feel it's such a huge gift. Yeah, that sense of gratitude, I find to be very important as we think about not just our physical connection with the lakes, but also that that spiritual connection with with the and the forests and the land and the rivers and all that are part of the basin. Now, it makes me think about something you said earlier, where a lot of people have a love for the lakes, but we don't necessarily take care of them. So where, you know, I think a lot of people have that, and they may not put it in those terms, but that spiritual connection, emotional connection, with the, the water and the lakes and everything. But where do you think that gap comes from in terms of, or why is that there between the way people feel about them and yet what the, the actions that they take? Many different relationships with nature. And, you know, I was brought up really to respect nature and, um, you know, to always be thinking of how you care for things. And, you know, as they say, don't leave anything but your footprints behind. Uh, um, that was very much a strong ethic. I think in some cases, um, it's more of a utilitarian purpose. It's 
how can I use these resources to have fun, to raise my family, you know, to, um, I mean, it's just a very different mindset and not necessarily thinking that you need to replenish what you use. And, and then, I, you know, I do think we're a throwaway society. Uh, we've gotten so used to uh, replacing things and tossing, you know, the old and constantly going after the new. I was struck with um, a young woman, my husband and I are very big into reusing things. And she had uh, just had a baby, young couple, not married yet, and they were setting up an apartment. And so we set out all kinds of things for them to be able to come through thinking of what you need to have an apartment. And it was very clear, she wasn't interested in anything that was used. She said, but I can go, you know, to the you know retail store and get this and that and she wanted it all new and it just it made me so sad because one they didn't have a lot you know of free money uh extra money but you know just that total disconnect with the idea of reusing something you know she'd rather just get it new and i think too unfortunately we're like that we've all had the situation with technology where every new phone has a new plug-in and new gadgets. And so what you had before can't be used. And that's really hurting our planet that we've you know, become that. It seems, and I don't wanna put this in too overly religious or spiritual terms, but it, it seems like there's a conversion that sort of a conversion process of people's thinking of their hearts and of their, of their minds about looking at things and approaching things differently. Um, so I, maybe this isn't the right connection, but what it strikes me is the emphasis that your career has had, and, and in current, including your current work with the Watershed Council, on citizen science, of people sort of getting involved and in doing something to, to care for the lakes. Do you find that that makes a difference in people's attitude and things beyond just the actual gathering of data? Oh, absolutely. I think the more you can get people out in nature and spending time with it in particularly in a way where they're feeling like they're improving it i think it changes their behavior from then on you know once you have that exposure of doing something good for nature it's a little bit of a paradigm shift if you haven't done that before and um, where i used to work we had a film festival and after we'd see some of these films that sometimes they were really tough to watch you know it would be about uh, what plastics are doing to um, ocean and Great Lakes life. And, you know, it, it you, made you think you're just going to eat vegetables for the rest of your life immediately <laughs> afterwards. But I would have people say, um, wow, you know, I, I'll never be the same after watching that. It's completely changed, you know, my thought process. And that, to me, is what, that's that importance of education and making connections. And making those connections locally for people to see that impact right here in their own you know backyard uh, so to speak um, there are problems there are significant problems and all you have to do is start right there you know as they say bloom where you're planted you know mm -hmm. um, i think that that can make a huge difference as you think about those people that have gotten, I mean, obviously we're talking like a lot of different people, so I don't mean to, to reduce it too much, but as you think about the journey in a sense that people make from, from not doing something to doing something, whether it be citizen science or eating vegetables only or whatever it might be, is it, is it, do you find that people get involved with things because they're already there mostly, or have you seen people really like, dramatically, like you just mentioned, dramatically change the way they think about things, but then actually translate that into to practice. I'm just always wondering about that, that's, that journey that people make from, from not doing something to doing something. I think it's different for different people, but when something has that very personal connection, when it affects someone's personal life, I think that's what's most striking. I've always believed that children were a great way for educating adults. Um, when we've had programs, you know, I've worked on recycling programs and had parents contact me and say, you know, I need a parent version of this because my kids keep on going through my trash and I, I can't get anything right. And so kids do, um, 
I think they are our future, but they're also our present. And um, I've seen that with the students that we've worked with. And, you know, the part that's tough is when students do things like beach cleanups or curbside cleanup type activities, and then they go back a couple more weeks and they see it's all back again. And that gets very, very frustrating for them. And, you know, they, they make strong appeals to adults. And, and we, unfortunately, you know, youth have been getting more involved in public policy initiatives as well. And the level of frustration by that process has been very discouraging for them. So I, I worry about the weight that puts on our young people's shoulders when they care so passionately and they don't see adults responding. That's a, that's a great point. Well, I mean, I think that's true for adults too, not seeing adults responding. And it, it's hard to keep that, that uh, hope going with that. So for you personally, what, what is the thing that gives you hope? What keeps you moving forward? One, just seeing how mother nature does renew itself. You know, it, it seems to me that the planet will go on. It's that maybe the people, the lively, you know, the, the flora and fauna that we know today and human beings may not be the same in the future. But Mother Nature is pretty restorative. And so, of course, every season, you know, every fresh snow, every new bloom, you know, inspires me and gives me hope. Uh, but I also think, it, you know, it goes back to our young people. They get a lot of what's going on right now. And they're very frustrated um, and determined, and they understand that they carry a lot of responsibility because if anything's going to change, I think a lot of times they feel like they're the ones who are going to have to do it because, you know, we're not picking up on things further. Uh, but I also think that's what are my choices, you know? <laughs> I can choose to be in despair or I can choose to make every day count and be as hopeful as possible and, you know, look at that new sunrise or that sunset and look at that as an opportunity to start over or reset. And so I think, you know, it really is nature itself that comes home for me to keep me feeling hopeful. Sure. Well, speaking of hope, what, um, what do you hope? for the Watershed Council moving forward? What are some of the things that you're hoping that the group will do? Oh, I'm so inspired with the work that our staff do, and particularly at that local level. Um, the need to have people who have strong technical backgrounds, who understand the science, work with those you know, who are making important policy decisions on a daily basis. Whether it's the zoning administrator, the planning commission, you know, the county commission, they're making decisions that will have very long term impacts. And so our staff, both, you know, in the field and at, you know, the public meetings are there to provide that sound technical support, you know, showing them one, how they can help protect their watershed themselves physically outdoors, but also how they can draft good local ordinances that comply with the state and federal laws and without that connection i've seen some really unfortunate things happen where people come in and they know that that body of government is not strong and they can do whatever they want and they do and yet when you have a strong watershed council like we have here in northern michigan they really can make a huge difference on a case-by-case -case basis and oftentimes with people who have no other place to go, you know, they've tried to work with local officials, they've tried to work with their neighbors. And, you know, if you're not careful, everything you have could be gone, at least in your mind, you know, it's not like everything you have is in land and, you know, um, property type of things, but there's that feeling of, you know, kind of the, uh, David and Goliath situation. And so I think the Watershed Council, in a very fair way, you know, our goal isn't necessarily to take everybody to court at all. It's really to try to help people communicate with each other and find that place in the center where we can do good work to protect the watershed and help people understand why that's important. Yeah. 
it strikes me that one of the themes of your work um, is just, again, we've come back to this a couple of different times, getting people involved and engaged and like hands-on involved, whether it's doing data collecting or cleanups or even involved in trying to fighting for what's happening to them on their piece of property or their land or their wa the water that runs through that land. And I, I see it, that theme is running through not just individually getting people involved, but getting a part, involved in part of a movement, a group of people. And, and I don't know if this is true for you or not, but for me, that would almost be a spiritual experience in and of itself. This idea of being in this together with all these folks, it, it, do you find, even your staff maybe, do you find that to be true? Absolutely. When you can, the energy of being with people and having a moment, you know, I, I refer to it as a watershed moment, you know, when you all come to the same understanding that, I, you know, there's a, a lot of room between all and nothing. And sometimes we all have to give a little to do what's best in the long run. And when that happens, it's it's definitely a a spiritual experience it's a uh, a feeling that you've done really good work that day you know mm. it means a lot oh. well that's oh that's great um that's a great place to end our conversation uh katie so thank you very much for for uh talking today i really appreciate it and um and uh, i hope we get to connect again soon and, and good luck with the work with the watershed council Thank you. Uh, we need a lot of luck. <laughs> there's hard work and there's luck right now. We're hoping that the weather warms up so that we can get out in the field and start our testing and um, you know stream monitoring and lake monitoring. That's great. Well, good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Take care.